Anyway, it's a joy to be here and share with you from the Word of God. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. Uh, all the messages that we're going to be uh, doing over the course of these meetings are going to be from the Gospels. It'd be good to preach the Gospel from the Gospels, wouldn't it? So that's what we're going to do. And I uh, just want to mention the other meetings, uh, just if you could support them, we're glad you're here tonight. But uh, tomorrow for the men, there's a breakfast at 9 a.m. here. And uh, we'd love to, if you're male, uh, we would love to have you here and uh, share the breakfast with us. And then a message will be given as well. And then tomorrow evening, same time, 6.30, same place. And tonight we're going to think of hope for the fallen. Tomorrow, hope for the broken. And then Sunday morning, we're going to deal with hope in the face of death at 11 o'clock right here. And then there'll be a free lunch. I said there's not such a thing as a free lunch, but I can tell you it will be a free lunch. It will not cost you anything. And then uh, Sunday at 1 p.m., final message, hope for the self-righteous. So that's what we're going to be doing. And we'd, we'd, we'd love to have you with us for all of those, as many as you can. That would be a great encouragement. So the, the thing we said is it, of this conference is real hope in a broken world. And I think we, we don't need much convincing that the world is broken. And I know there are people, politicians, that say they're going to fix it, but they're not going to be able to. It's totally broken. And we see it, just headlines today, what happened at a football game in Amsterdam and people were basically attacked. And that's uh, just uh, incredible. It, wherever you look in the world, there's trouble. And so the one thing that gives hope in a broken world is that the Lord Jesus is able to change broken people one at a time. And that's the, that's the only hope for this broken world. So tonight we're going to talk about hope for the fallen. And I want to explain what I mean by fallen before we actually go to this passage of Scripture. Because uh, it's interesting that we're living in the time of the year that's called the fall, right? You remember what happens in the fall? Well, the reason they call it fall, in England we call it autumn, but you guys call it the fall. Because leaves fall from a high place down to a low place. They all end up on the ground, don't they? And so this world is their hope for the fallen. It's a fallen world uh, because it wasn't intended to be like this. But when God created this world, at the end of that creation, he says, it was very good. But it's fallen from that state. Right now, there's hurricanes, there's earthquakes, there's tornadoes, and then there's all the things that are going on with man. And man, as well, in that creation week, he was also made and he was good. Not so good now. And the interesting thing about man was that he was made in the image and likeness of God. But there's been a fall, and he's fallen from that beautiful place. And uh, although there's still some evidence of that image, it's very marred by and broken by sin. So I want to think about hope for the fall. And I'm going to read from the Luke's Gospel, chapter 8. I'm going to read from verse 26, just to, down to verse 36. So just 10 verses. If you've got Bibles, I would love you to turn there with me, because realistically, this is God speaks through his word. And uh, we, we just can't put enough emphasis on the public reading of the word of God, because that's what God speaks through. So with Luke 8, uh, and if you can't find your way around, if there's somebody next to you, they can help you find your way to Luke 8, 26. So it begins this way. It says, they arrived in the, at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And when he went forth to land there, met him out of the city, a certain man, which had devils or demons a long time, and he wore no clothes, neither abode in any house but in the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for oftentimes it had caught him, and he was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and he broke the bounds and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. 
And Jesus asked him, saying, what is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. And there was there a herd of many swine feeding on the mountain, and they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them, and he suffered them. Then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine. The herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. When they that had fed him saw what fed them saw what was done, they fled and went and told it in the city and in the country. Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They also which saw it told them by what means he that was possessed of the devils was healed. So that's the story we want to deal with this evening. It's a true story that happened to real people. And so we want to just look at this story and then look at how does that apply to our day and to us. I want to begin just by saying something by way of background. It's kind of interesting that when we notice this portion, if you look at verse 22, it tells us that it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples and said to them, let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they make a trip from one side of the lake, the Sea of Galilee, uh, over to the other side. And notice verse 40, it says, it came to pass that when Jesus was returned. So the whole point is this. This whole journey over the lake was just for one reason, for one person. That was, that's what it was all about. They went across. The Lord Jesus dealt with this man. They got back in the boat and went back to the other side. And, and isn't that amazing that the Lord Jesus came on a special journey just for one person. Amen. Across a, a stormy lake, <laughs> we're going to see that there was a great storm blew up as they went across in that boat. And I want to suggest to you that that same Lord Jesus came on a special journey all the way from heaven so that he might reach you as an individual and bring sanity to your world and your life. That's how compassionate he is that he would make such a journey as this. Notice that I mentioned that there was a storm blew up. And again, that shows that the world is not how it is meant to be. It wasn't made like this. It's a fallen world. And so he says in verse 23, but as they sailed, he fell asleep. So Lord Jesus, and there came down a storm of wind on the lake and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him saying, master, master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, wondering, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and water, and they obey him. Now, this is, this is quite the miracle, because if you have a storm, on a body of water, any sailor will tell you this, that even if the wind stops, the waves do not calm down immediately, right? There's the, the after effect, the water still kind of moves around for quite a while, but the Lord Jesus is doing a double miracle here. He stills the wind and he calms the sea that one can out, and there it is. And the message is this, just as we said, Jesus came on a special journey down from heaven, for one individual, a very troubled individual. And just as he was able to calm that troubled sea, he's able to calm this man who's even more troubled, more wilder than the wildest sea, and the Lord is able to deal with him just in the same way. And whatever tempests and storms are in your life because of sin, I know that Jesus can bring peace and calm to your soul this night. That's what he does. He's great at doing that, to bring people who were so troubled, so disturbed, maybe by different things, and yet he can give that person a peace 
that passes all understanding. And that's why we're having these meetings, because there's a lot of troubled souls in our world. And the only way they'll find peace is through the Lord Jesus, who is that Prince of Peace. So as we look at this man of the Gadarenes, it's a very simple way we're going to approach it. We want to look at his condition before he met Christ. And then we want to focus a few minutes on his deliverer, the Lord Jesus himself. And then we want to look at his condition after Christ. And we're going to, as we contrast what he was like before Christ, and after Christ, we're going to see it's a stark contrast. And that's the most wonderful thing, that anybody who has come to the Savior, they, they all have the same story. They have a before Christ story, what they were like. And some were pretty wild characters. And then they meet this Jesus. And then there's an afterward story. It's an after Christ, and all of a sudden, everything's different. In fact, the Bible puts it this way, they're, they're new creations. It's like they're new creatures. They've been transformed. They're not what they used to be. I was saying just before my 21st birthday, as Kurt said, and I could say that I was a pretty wild individual before I came to Christ. And so I'm just so thankful that I have a before Christ, and when I met Christ, and an after Christ story, and you can have the same thing this evening. And that's the most wonderful thing about the gospel. And so we're going to end up with just applying it to you and I. So first of all, we want to think of what it was like before he uh, met Christ. Verse 29, it says, He had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for oftentimes it had caught him. He was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and he broke the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. I want you to notice, first of all, his physical strength. He's bound with chains and fetters, and it says he break the chains. That's amazing, isn't it? I mean, chains, by their very nature, are designed to restrain the wildest men and the wildest beasts. But they can't seem to restrain this man. He has incredible physical strength. And can I suggest to you that this physical strength, perhaps that's what led him into the fascination with the demonic world. See, people, you know, don't just drift into being like this man, <laughs> filled with demons. They don't, they just don't, they're not born that way and they don't drift into it, but there's usually something. And, and part of what it is, is uh, people that get involved in occult things, they want to have an edge over everybody else. And they feel like if they can get into this supernatural power, it will give them some kind of an edge. And so perhaps it was curiosity with this desire to have super strength that brought him in there. But I want to tell you, there's a high price to getting involved in the occultic world. Because we not only see that, yes, he did have that strength. But we're gonna, when we look at the rest of the picture, we're going to see that was a tremendous price that he paid for that. And I want just to say that Satan always ensnares people with a tried and tested strategy of offering something attractive, but there's always a high price tag at the end of it. That's how it works. Yeah. So in the Garden of Eden, he said to the first pair, the first human couple, Adam and Eve, he says, um, if you eat this, you're going to be like gods. That sounded pretty appealing, didn't it? And yet what happened afterwards? They're kicked out of the garden. They're aware of their sinfulness. Just the whole tragedy of what we call the fallen world came because they wanted this edge. They wanted to be of the gods. And we see that in so many ways. People get involved in drink um, because they think it gives them courage, a buzz, and all the rest of it. And many of them end up in complete and utter bondage to it. Drugs. People want to get high. Psychedelic experience. And yet you see them, don't you, around this city. The end results of it, teeth falling out, gaunt individuals, their bodies are wrecked, uh, arms fill the holes because of needles and uh, life expectantly lower dramatically. Uh, you see, the idea is this, Satan is a liar. He offers things, but he doesn't tell you what it's going to cost you. And what it will ultimately cost you is your eternal soul, your eternal destiny. 
And so he's a lion. So this man had bought into the lie. Uh, you know that this guy was once a cute, cuddly little baby. Mm -hmm. don't, we don't think about these things. Here, this man living in the tombs, naked, scaring people to death, once was a cute, cuddly little baby. I might tell you this Adolf Hitler was once a cute, cuddly little baby. All the monsters of society were once cute, cuddly little babies. And so here's this terrible man, attracted by brute force. He surrenders his life to occult control. I want you to notice his moral weakness. Verse 27, when he went forth to land there, met him out of the city, a certain man who had devils a long time and wore no clothes, neither aboard in any house, but in the tombs. So here he is, this strong man, can break chains, and yet we see he's in bondage. He wore no clothes. He's naked. He's lost all sense of self-respect. No sense of shame anymore. By the way, the more the culture gives in to Satan's lies, the more it loses a sense of self-respect and shame comes along with it. And here's this man, no shame whatsoever, uh, hardened conscience, and he's homeless. He did have a home at one time, because if you look at verse 39, the Lord Jesus, after he's dealt with him, he says, return to thine own house. He once had a house, but now we don't have a house. He's living in a graveyard. And so he's, he's homeless and he's living among the tombs, the place of death. It's really a good graphic picture of his life. His life is a living death. In, in fact, he's spiritually dead and he's merely existing and he's living out there in this terrible condition out in amongst the tombs, no kind of life at all. And uh, we can see that, again, our society, as it becomes more preoccupied with the occultic world, there's more preoccupation not only with nakedness, but with death as well. It's a death cult. It really is. And so here's this man amongst the graves. Why would anybody want to live there? And of course... He said he wants that at home, but Satan wants to destroy not only a person, but a person's home life as well. He wants that home, but now we know where he is. We won't turn there, but in Mark's gospel, there's a parallel account. We call these synoptic gospels in that they tell the same story, but from different viewpoints. And in Mark's gospel, it says, as well as these things, he was cutting himself. He had this self-destructive tendency of harming himself physically, cutting himself. And so um, you might say, well, you know, what's this guy got to do with me? Like, I'm not like that, and I'm glad you're not. But what I'm saying is, see, see, it's good to look at the extreme here, but somewhere along that pathway from someone made in the image and likeness of God to becoming fallen, we're somewhere along that tra trajectory, right? We're not the way God intended us to be. And every one of our lives have things in them that ought not to be there. That, and there are things we should be ashamed of. And so we, we might say this, that um, we may not be involved to the same degree as this man, but you're still believing the same lives if you do not know Christ as your Savior. The Bible says that you're under the prince of the power of the air. You're under his sway. You're under your your thinking, your mindset, your lifestyle is all governed by the lies of the enemy. And it's only when you meet Jesus Christ that you can be changed. Also, this man was powerless to deliver himself. And I want to suggest to you, religion couldn't help him either. Programs to restrain him hadn't worked. They tried to chain him. He broke the chains. And everything that people had tried had already failed. There was nothing that could set this man free except the Lord Jesus. You see, he's the great bondage breaker. He's the great deliverer. He is the one that came to set men free. And, and he's, he's the great emancipator. One other account in Matthew's gospel, it said he was exceeding fierce so that no man might pass by that way. 
what a description, exceedingly fierce that no one would pass mm -hmm. by that way. He, you, you could say this, he was the ultimate neighbor from hell. <laughs> you, you would go out of your way to go around where this man was. He was a terror to everyone, including himself. And nobody could help him. So having looked at him and seen his story, I want you to notice his deliverer. Notice verse 29. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. I want you to notice, first of all, about the Lord Jesus, that he has absolute authority even over the demonic world. He commanded and they came out. He just speaks, that's enough. His word, his word is so powerful that he's able to deliver this man in an instant from these evil spirits. Notice, too, he not only does he have authority over them, but they fall down before him. Look at verse 28. It says, and when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him. And again, he's controlled by these legion of demons. We'll talk about what that really means in a minute. But, but they fell down before him. Uh, he had command over them. We saw that in verse 29. He commanded the unclean spirits to come out of them. And so these powerful beings are subject to his command. He alone can break the power of evil in a person's life. And you know how he does it? Through the power of his word. Just as he set this man free, free by speaking... So God's word can set you free from whatever bondage you find yourself in. It's the power of his word that sets men free. Also, notice his title. What do these demons call him? Verse 28 again. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him. And with a loud voice said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God, most high? You see, the demons knew exactly who he was, and they were right. He is indeed the Son of God. The Jews understood this. Uh, that's why they crucified him, because he said he was the Son of God. And so he is God's uh, eternal Son who came down on this mission to deliver men. And then his coming judgment, again in verse 28, he says at the end of the verse, I beseech thee, torment me not. And so obviously this demon realizes that ultimately there's a coming day when he will be judged. And this, these demons will be tormented and it will be the Lord Jesus who is going to issue that command for them. Because he says, to Je torment me not. Now here's the interesting thing. This, these demons have been tormenting this man for years. And yet, they say, torment me not. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. <laughs> and so this is where they're at. They're, uh, they don't want to be tormented. They know he's the one. In fact, he's going to one day send them into the abyss. The end of verse 31, it says, uh, they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. The deep is a place called the abyss. It's, it's basically a bottomless pit where demons will one day be confined. Imagine, if you ever have that dream that you're falling and there's no bottom, I don't know if you ever had that dream, it's a nightmare, but, but that's the idea, a bottomless pit, there's no end to it. So basically, uh, this is the one who is the deliverer. And I want you to notice his compassion. Even though this man was a person that most people wouldn't want anything to do with, Jesus had compassion on him. And he commanded, verse 29, the unclean spirit to come out of the man. He cared for this man. Now, it's interesting. You know, he, he talks about we're legion, for we are many. Uh, and it's interesting that legion, uh, the Roman legion was five to 6,000 soldiers. So if that's true, this man is really a messed up individual. Talk about demon possession. This guy is, he's got it fully. Five to six thousand. And yet the Lord commands them because he cared for this man. And I can honestly say without hesitation that the Lord Jesus Christ is just as compassionate this evening as he was when this event took place. In fact, whatever's going on in your life, I can say to you without hesitation, nobody cares for you like Jesus. 
And he has come to set you free. And he wants to set you free. In fact, it says, John 8, 36, If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. His compassion for men and women gripped by Satan's power is never more clearly seen in him coming to Calvary and to the cross. Because it says that God demonstrated his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, while we're at our very worst, Christ died for us. That's the compassion of the Savior. And so let's think about his condition after Christ, and then we're going to apply all this and wrap it up. And it's quite a graphic description of a transformed life. He's We're going to see this man is going to be humbly and adoringly sat at the feet of the Lord Jesus. So notice verse 35, and it says <clears throat> that the devils were departed out of him. It says, and they went to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man of whom the devils were departed. And so, first of all, all of these demons that have plagued him for so long are now completely gone from him. Secondly, uh, we notice that he's sitting at the feet of Jesus and he is clothed and in his right mind. And so what a transformation. This wild man now sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed, no longer naked, no longer, and then he is absolutely in his right mind. Wow, that's tremendous, isn't it? What a transformation. And it's amazing as if we had more time, Luke's gospel is full of people that find themselves sitting at the feet of Jesus. It's kind of a theme. He just kind of has all these people that come and sit at the feet of Jesus. And it's a wonderful thing when a person has been set free from their bondage for them to sit down at the feet of Jesus in just adoring worship and wonder for what he has done for them. And by the way, there's a day coming if you don't come to Christ before you die, there's going to be a time when you will find yourself at the feet of Jesus. Because every knee will bow to him, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But it will be out of compulsion then. Tonight you have an opportunity of doing it freely out of your own choice. And what a difference that will make to your eternal destiny. And so I just want you to notice that, uh, that uh, this, is, this man's life has been transformed. And, uh, and you know, it's amazing. I can tell you so many stories of people whose lives have been transformed. I'm just going to tell you one story. It's a great story. Uh, uh, there was uh, two girls, and one of them, she was involved with the Hells Angels. In fact, she was shacked up with a guy who was one of the leading Hells Angels in the city of Leeds, where I grew up. And then there's this other girl, and she gives herself to be a missionary to the, uh, the Indians in the tribes of Brazil. Two different, very different girls. But you know what the amazing thing is? It's actually the same girl. Mm -hmm. I know her personally. She was transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so instead of being involved in the Hell's Angels, she becomes a missionary to the, the Amazon jungle tribal people. Now, isn't that amazing? And you see, that's that's the kind of thing. I'm not just, you see, this story is relevant because God is still doing this kind of stuff today to people's lives, transforming them, changing them. Their whole trajectory has changed. And, and so he can do that to you. Notice as well, he wants to be with Jesus. Initially, he says, what have I to do with thee? And now he wants to be with Jesus. He's sitting at the feet of Jesus. He wants to stay with him. Uh, in fact, verse 38, the man out of whom the devils were departed besought him that he might be with him. In fact, there's nobody he wants to spend time with more than the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a mark, by the way, of somebody who's truly saved. They want to spend time with Jesus. And this man does. He just wants to be with Jesus. So that's a difference. And then the Lord says an amazing thing to him in verse 39. He says, return to thine own house and show how great things God 
hath done unto thee. Now, I, I just want you to use your imagination with me just for a minute. But can you imagine when he enters into his home community? People would recognize him instantaneously, and they would immediately have memories of what kind of a guy this was. And then somebody would run to his house. Maybe he had kids. I don't know, but you could just, I'm just using your imagination. Not that your dad's back in town. And the kids would probably be gripped with fear. But then he shows up at the door and he's an altogether different man, isn't he? And he's there to demonstrate something. How great things Jesus hath done unto him. And isn't that wonderful that we can see that happening? I want you to notice just another contrasting thing here, because we're going to see there's two responses to the Savior that are seen in this chapter. In verse 37, it says, The whole multitude of the country of the Gadarenes round about besought him to depart from them. Isn't that interesting? We don't want you. Get away from us. And here's this other man, and he says, I want to be with you. And you see, that kind of is a picture of different responses to the Savior today. There are some people, and they say, I don't want anything to do with Jesus. Go away. Don't tell me. Don't talk to me about it. I don't want to know about that man. And they want to go. They want to live their lives without him. They want to put him in the picture. And then there are others who have experienced his delivering power. And they say, I want to be with Jesus. So it sums up the human race, divided into two distinct groups based on their responses to the Lord Jesus. And it describes the two different responses in this room. I don't know who you are. I know some of you. Some of you I don't know. What is your response to the Lord Jesus? And notice the Lord complied with their request. He got in the boat and he left. You know, the Lord Jesus is a perfect gentleman. He's not going to force himself on you against your will. But if you want him in your life, he's so happy to come into your life and change you and transform you. But if you say, no, I don't want that, that's, that's your choice. But I want to tell you, it's a very costly choice. <laughs> Because to reject him is to reject the only way to heaven. Because he said, I am the way, the truth, <laughs> and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Maybe you're somebody who's just putting it off. Maybe you know you should come to Christ. You should believe in him. You should trust in him. But you're putting it off. But the problem is, the longer you wait... The chains that are binding you leave scars. See, this man, I don't know how long he'd had chains, but it kept breaking, but, but, but I'm sure there, were, there, there was evidence of his scars from the past. And the longer you leave putting off trusting Jesus Christ, the more scars will still be there. He'll save you, he'll change you, but you'll still have the scars. It's better to turn to Christ now. So, what are we supposed to do? I want to just kind of bring it home now to for the final thought. You see, remember, to, for Jesus to get to this man and to change him, he was crossing the lake and there was a great storm. I want to tell you that in order to reach the human race, the Lord Jesus made a great journey. But part of that journey included a great storm. See, when he was on the cross at Calvary, one of the Psalms says, all God's waves and billows came over him. What does that mean? It means that the reason Jesus died on the cross was to pay the penalty of our sin, of this man's sin, of your sin. And in order to pay that penalty, he had to take the judgment, even though he was perfect, righteous, holy, never done anything wrong. And so there was a great storm broke in those three hours of darkness when all of God's holy hatred against sin was poured out on his son, Jesus Christ. 
And the Lord Jesus took it all. In fact, he cried out at the end of that darkness, it is finished. He had paid the penalty in full for your sin. So what are you to do? How do you respond to that? Well, my question to you is this. Have you believed that you're a sinner, that you deserve judgment, and that Jesus Christ loved you so much that he willingly took the punishment that was yours? You see, you believe on him, Scripture says. You will not perish, but have everlasting life. And I'm going to ask the question, has there ever been a time in your life where you have trusted fully that Jesus died for you on Calvary's cross? That you're, you're tired of the change, you're tired of that sin, you don't want to live like that anymore. You want this new life that he can give you, and you're coming to him in your brokenness and in your fallenness. Say, Lord, save me. You know the amazing thing is? He can do that right in your seat where you are. You don't even have to move. Just in your heart, you have to move and say, Lord, I want to be saved. And you know, the amazing thing is that if you do that, you'll never be sorry. Can you imagine this man of the Gadarenes? Do you think he was sorry that Jesus came by him that day? We're going to meet those of us that are believers. We're going to meet that fellow one day. And we'll go to him you're the one. He said, yeah, I'm the one. But we'll meet a lot of others that also had chains and scars caused by different aspects of sin, but people who the Lord has gloriously delivered. And he wants to deliver you. I don't know what your situation is. I don't know what's going on in your heart, but I do know this. I know that if you're not saved, it means you're lost. And if you're lost, you're in a very deep predicament because... You see, death is the ultimate statistic. Mm -hmm. One in one dies. Somebody in this room will be the next one to go, and it could be you. And so you want to be sure that you really know where you're going when you die. And tonight you can know that. I've got a little booklet here. I've got some at the back. Consider the evidence. If you want to take one of these booklets, we've got some. We're glad you to take it. Uh, it really will help you to just consider what Jesus did on Calvary's cross, and maybe you'll take that, and you personally will make that your own. So let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you that there is real hope in a broken world. And we, we're thankful that there's hope for the fallen. Here's a man who has fallen so deeply, yet the Lord Jesus made this special journey in order to reach him. Father, we're thankful that the Lord Jesus made a special journey, leaving your side in heaven to come to this world to reach broken, fallen people, perhaps even one person in this room tonight. Lord, I pray for their hearts to respond in faith to the Lord Jesus and what he did on Calvary. And say, Lord, I'm a sinner that you died to save. Save me. We'll give you the praise and glory in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for your attention.